Well, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium and looking forward to today's discussion of research conducted with exceptions to informed consent waivers. And so before we get started, a few housekeeping rules on the next slide. Um, want to remind you to submit any questions you have throughout the event using the Q&A function on your screen not the chat feature. The chat feature is for any technical issues that might come up. Um, you're welcome to follow us on social media. We use the hashtag policy ethics or HMS bioethics. And uh, please do be sure to subscribe to the bioethics newsletter for any upcoming events and to know what's going to be coming next. Um, so welcome to this consortia and the Objectives for this series are to discuss and identify key issues in healthcare systems and public health, and especially those that are raising challenges for ethics in policy or in practice. And we bring together experts who have different perspectives on the issue to define the issue, understand some of the problems, and start to think about what those solutions might be. And we invite you all into this conversation with us and we hope that this sparks uh, further conversation and discussion in your own work. So today's event is on emergency uh, research coming up. We have an event in December that will be looking at the World Health Organization's essential medicines list and we will start the new year in January with a discussion of clinical trial participants and participation. Uh, but turning to today, I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, William Feldman, who is a pulmonologist, intensivist, and health services researcher at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he has a joint appointment in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics and the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. His research focuses on drug pricing, FDA regulation, pharmaceutical policy, and research ethics. He also co-chairs the Ethics Committee at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has completed his medical degree at the University of California, San Francisco, his doctorate in political philosophy at the University of Oxford, his MPH at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and his internal medicine residency in pulmonary critical care fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So, Will, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Leah. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. So thank you so much, Leah, and, and thank you all for being here today. I'm so delighted that um, we have Carrie Sims and Neil Dicker with us. I can't think of two better people to, to talk about these, these really challenging issues with. So thank you to both of them. I'm just going to talk very briefly about exceptions from informed consent, a little bit of background, and then I'll introduce our guests for today. So I'll start with an example just to highlight the, the challenges of, of conducting certain types of research with consent. So this was an, a, a, an exception from informed consent trial that, that was published in the England Journal in 2016. And it was looking at interventions for out of hospital cardiac arrest. So looking at, at uh, whether amiodarone, lidocaine or placebo was, uh, was effective in the setting of out of hospital cardiac arrest. And the, the basic protocol was the paramedics would get a call would uh, get to the, the patient who, who suffered a cardiac arrest, would immediately start chest compressions, check the rhythm, defibrillate if indicated, and then give one of these um, interventions if the defibrillation did not restore circulation. So um, just to, to kind of highlight how, how tight the time window was. So the average time from call to the paramedics to delivery of one of the study drugs was <laughs> 20 minutes. And that includes getting to the scene, starting chest compressions, checking the rhythm, trying to defibrillate, and, and then getting IV, and then giving one of these, these um, study meds. So very tight time window. And also to highlight how, uh, how challenging consent would be because the patient, of course, by definition, has no capacity. The patient is, is, is incapacitated. And with this really tight time window, even if there was a, a, a surrogate decision maker standing right there, 
uh, so much is happening that it'd be really hard to, to conduct this type of research with informed consent. So in, in 1996, the FDA created this pathway, and that's what we'll be talking about today, um, which is abbreviated with EFIC, or Exception from Informed Consent. Pre-1996, there was there were trials uh, like this happening, but we're really going to focus today on kind of uh, after this has been codified over the last you know few decades, the, the, what what these trials have looked like and what ethical issues have come up. There are a handful of requirements that I just want to go through so that we're all on the same page. So uh, trials that that uh, are conducted with an exception from informed consent have to be for a life threatening condition where consent is infeasible because the patients can't consent, the time window for, for um, surrogate consent is, is too narrow, and there's no way to identify the patients prospectively. There has to be this, this prospect of direct benefit to participants based on animal or other preclinical studies. It must be the case that the research couldn't otherwise practicably be carried out. Investigators have to be committed to contacting surrogates before the intervention if possible and giving them a chance to consent. And, and the IRB, of course, has to have, have signed off on the consent plans and, and on all of this. So you can see how the, the trial for cardiac arrest that I mentioned before really um, satisfies these conditions in, a, in the kind of paradigmatic way where the really narrow time window for intervention, um, life-threatening condition, and I'd be hard to envision this research happening without uh, an exception from informed consent. And then there are these additional protections that are also outlined in the Code of Federal Re Regulations that are, I know our speakers will talk about a little bit that I, I wanna emphasize because they're so unique and distinctive to this setting. So one is community consultation that, that researchers have, actually have to go out into the communities where these trials are being conducted beforehand and engage in a back and forth with representatives about the, the research that's being planned. There is also a, a separate requirement for public disclosure. So prior to trial initiation, the, the um, investigators have to disclose the risks and benefits in, in sort of a, a wide scale fashion. So it has to be, you know, typically it's by radio, by television, on, on billboards, but, but engage in this kind of community um, disclosure to the community ahead of time. There's public disclosure of results afterwards that are required. You have to have a, an independent data safety monitoring committee. And then there's this requirement that's that's a little complicated to, to understand, but basically when, when consent isn't feasible and there's no legally authorized representative, the investigators are also committed to contacting a family member when possible um, during the therapeutic window to allow them a chance to opt out. So. What did these trials look like over the last few decades? This was a review that, that uh, was published a couple of years ago, but basically looking at 41 EFIC trials from, from 1996 to 2017, you'll see that about 40% were for cardiac arrest, but quite a number of other conditions that, that um, were studied. So, so hemorrhagic shock, traumatic brain injury, status epilepticus, ischemic stroke, uh, respiratory failure, and acute coronary syndrome. About half the trials were conducted in the pre-hospital setting and half in the hospital setting, but I'll just highlight that the pre-hospital trials are much, much bigger. So something like 80, 90% of participants were enrolled in, in pre-hospital um, pre trials. And then just to show on the right that about a quarter of the trials were, were um, studying devices, about half were studying drugs or fluids like vasopressin or, or hypertonic saline or anti-epileptics. And then uh, a quarter or a little bit less than a quarter, we're, we're looking at different types of process interventions. So there, there are a lot of ethical questions that I'm sure are coming to people's minds, just even hearing about some of these requirements. And I'll, I'll point out a few, and, and the, this list is by no means exhaustive. And I, you know, I'm sure we'll hear from, from our speakers about other uh, kind of ethical worries that have, have creeped in. But, but one hard question is, um, how should community consultation guide trial investigators? There's this requirement, but what should trial investigators do with the consultation? Another is, is how far should investigators go in locating legally authorized representatives or family members prior to an intervention? I gave the example of cardiac arrest where the, the time window is very narrow, but there are other 
conditions like stroke, where you have not just minutes, but maybe even a little bit longer um, on the order of hours, though earlier intervention, of course, is, is helpful, but not always seconds to minutes. What does it mean for consent to be impracticable? In some cases, you see trials conducted with an exception from informed consent at some sites and not others, which raises the question, is it is it um, truly impracticable if it's actually being done at sites with consent? And then are these trials equitable? So um, recent work has shown that uh, Black patients are, are disproportionately enrolled in uh, trials granted an exception from informed consent relative to, to population numbers in the US, uh, and it's something we can talk more about. But um, again, just four challenging questions uh, that, that to put on the table, but um, I want to uh, hand things over now to our, uh, our wonderful um, speakers, uh, Carrie Sims and Neil Dickert. I'm just going to introduce them. Let me stop my, my share. I'll, I'll introduce the two of them and then hand it over to Carrie. So Carrie Sims is the director of the Division of Trauma, Critical Care, and Burn at Ohio State University, Wexler Medical Center, and professor of surgery at Ohio State University Medical Center, where she holds the Olga uh, Jonasson Professorship in Surgery. She leads a lab studying mitochondrial dysfunction and late-stage hemorrhagic shock. She earned her medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, her, uh, master, her, her MPH from the University of California, Berkeley, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She did surgical uh, internship and residency here in Boston at MGH um, and fellowships at, at uh, Beth Israel at the Harvard Center for Mentally Invasive Surgery and uh, at MGH and Penn. And then Neil Dickert is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Emory University School of Medicine. He holds a, a secondary appointment in, in the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health and is a senior faculty at the Emory Center for Ethics and a member of the Emory Clinical Cardiovascular Research Institute. Um, his research focuses on ethical issues relevant to cardiology practice and clinical research. Um, Dr. Digger completed his medical school uh, training at, at Johns Hopkins and a PhD in health policy at, at uh, the Bloomberg School of Public Health and did medicine residency at, at Johns Hopkins and cardiology fellowship at Emory. So I'll hand it off to Carrie and just uh, want to say thank you. The, we have two sort of preeminent folks in the field um, who, who think a lot about some of these ethical issues, and uh, I'll hand it off to uh, Carrie. Let's see, I see if this is working. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, and Will, that was a very lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so my task today is to talk about exception from informed consent and sort of um, really how this affects the community or how do you define the community. And the objectives of my short section are to discuss the ethic guidelines and requirements, describe the challenges with defining what constitutes this community, um, and propose some recommendations for community consultation. And then um, hopefully this will inspire a really uh, interesting and hopefully thought-provoking discussion from the group. So it's hard to imagine, but the concept of um, informed consent is actually relatively new. And, um, really builds on the Belmont report, which uh, came out from the Tuskegee experiments in which they enrolled African-American uh, people, primarily men with um, syphilis, and then sort of just watched the progression of the disease, even when we knew that there were therapies for uh, late stage syphilis. Um, and there was a lot of outrage about this as there should have been. Um, and so this uh, instituted the um, Belmont uh, group, they put out this report. And I think these, um, the three things that came out of the Belmont report have really um, uh, been guide points for uh, how we look at informed consent and, and, and actually even um, without consent, as long as these, um, these uh, are you know, held valuable. Um, and the, those were the respect for persons, really autonomy, people have the right to choose what they do with their body or don't do with their body. And when we don't have autonomy, when the person has um, diminished autonomy, it is our obligation to actually protect those individuals. The second principle is beneficence and really minimizing harm and maximizing benefits. And finally, justice, that, that people who um, should share the burden of the research as well as the benefits of the research, and it shouldn't be in just one group and you know bearing all of the harm and, and none of the benefit. 
So this was codified um, then in 1991 with the, um, uh, the common rule, and this became the federal policy throughout the land if you were receiving federal dollars or you came from a, an organization that was federally funded. Um, but it really has become like how we do all clinical research. So even if you're not receiving federal dollars, this is really how we, we it's, the, it's the book of how we do it. And it's all about consent and who and when and how. And that consent, um, it's really important to realize that people have the right to mull over the data, think about whether or not they want to participate, and then even go back to talk to their, their family physician and then decide if they're going to um, participate in the research. And we've made really amazing strides particularly in the realm of cancer uh, with this type of informed consent and have benefited many, many people. The problem is that in my field uh, that trauma is really unplanned and time sensitive. Um, and so just as we'll discuss that it's, it's challenging uh, to get consent when there's really um, the life is on the line, there's not a lot of time uh, and there's a very short therapeutic window. And for me, you know, Trauma is my life. It's the leading cause of death in the US for, for young people, those under age of 44. And most of those deaths occur secondary to hemorrhagic shock or brain injury. And we have a very time sensitive uh, uh, moment to actually intervene and have some meaningful uh, impact uh, called a golden hour. So um, you would think that we would have lots of therapies um, that would be driving how we do with best practices. And the truth of the matter is we have very few uh, uh, proven therapies that have been investigated in any rigorous way in clinical trials to actually guide the way that we take care of trauma patients. And much of what we do is the, it's the dirty little secret of trauma is that we really what we do is based on a lot of animal data, gut sense, and sort of what has worked in the past. And that may not be the best way to actually improve lives. So, um, by definition, most of our patients are unable to provide consent. Their LARs are not available. And so how do we make, uh, you know, how do we make advancements in trauma that benefit all of society as a whole while continuing to protect the individual patient? So they recognize that this was an issue uh, and the standard research makes it impossible for things like cardiac arrest, stroke and trauma. And in 1996, they developed the exception from informed consent requirements for emergency research, which we're gonna talk about today a little bit. It. And just as Will mentioned, it, it, it really has very tight criteria for who can be involved in this kind of research. It has to be a life-threatening condition. The available treatments have to be unproven or unsatisfactory, and there has to be a very narrow therapeutic window. Otherwise, your research doesn't qualify for this exception. And as we go through it, you can see that the, the people who created the exception from informed consent requirements really tried to adhere to those same Belmont report principles um, so that we could protect our patients. And so consent's not, not possible. So how do we protect autonomy for those folks? So patients are lacking their decisional capacity. It, the intervention has to be done uh, without the person being there or their LAR being there. Um, and you can't identify those subjects prospectively. So if you don't fit into this category, you are not EFIC. You, you can't really uh, apply for EFIC. And then there has to be direct benefit to the patients themselves. So the life-threatening condition needs some kind of treatment that is uh, you know, absolutely necessary. We have to have very good animal and preclinical study to indicate that there's going to be benefit to that person. And the risks of uh, therapy have to be reasonable compared to the standard therapy and the usual outcome. So as mentioned, there needs to be a consultation and that the consultation, the wording is that it has to be representatives of the communities in which the research will be conducted and from which the subjects will be drawn. Um, there has to be a public disclosure, both pre and after the study. And then there has to be a way for folks to say, I don't wanna participate in this research and how to opt out. Uh, in general, that usually ends up being these bans, which have been uh, shown to be pretty ineffective um, in terms of getting people to opt out. Um, but if you really feel strongly that you're not going to participate, then you can usually get an opt out ban. But there's really no great way that we've identified for people to say, I don't want to participate in EFIC. So unfortunately, when you look at these guidelines, they're actually, um, they're not very standardized. Um, and so IRBs there have, or have variable interpretations of you know, what does it mean to consult? Who should we be consulting? How do we disclose both pre and post? How do we have people opt out? And so there's no, there's no defined way of doing that. And unfortunately, I think that has led to the minimization of the ethical imperative to adhere to these rules entirely. Um, I'm going to th throw that out there and, and you know, hopefully that'll be a point of discussion as well. But there's no, there's no real guidelines. And unfortunately, because there are no strict guidelines, 
Um, I think that has actually led to a lot of the wiggle room that Dr. Feldman was sort of talking about where you use ethic in one place and, and another institution is doing it without ethics. So is it truly ethic if you can get away with it? So when I, um, when thinking about the community and who speaks for the community, um, I found this study to be very interesting. It was like one of the first studies that looked at um, automatic defibrillation and they did a um, uh, study in New York in which they got a bunch of focus groups and these high rises and they had these structured interviews and they were really um, trying to figure out, you know, who, who is this community that we're supposed to be consulting um, and what they found is that there is a lot of dis, dis, um, congruence between what people think as the community for the general community. When you describe it as what is the community, it's often demographic and geographic. But when you start to ask them about what their their community, my community looks like, you can see that there's, it's very different. So the general community is in, in marked out in um, the, the white bars and the views about my community are actually in the black bars. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, discongruence there. So we did a study at the University of Pennsylvania looking at vasopressin, uh, whether or not you could give vasopressin and help um, uh, decrease blood loss in trauma patients who were experiencing life-threatening hemorrhage. And you know, we wanted to do it in a way that honored our community, thinking that we are primarily in, a, um, in an underprivileged uh, environment. We didn't want, uh, there's a lot of stigma attached to research, um, particularly uh, in the African-American community. That's where our patient population comes from, from, from uh, for the most part. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we were actually really honoring this concept of community and, and trying to figure out like, who is the trauma patient's community? And so we set about to look at uh, focus groups, trauma patients and family members. We did some structured interviews to talk about the research that we were gonna do when we sort of dovetailed this into our public disclosure concept. And then we also gave some surveys out. Um, and what we found was that um, the patients uh, compared to the trauma, the trauma patients compared to the focus groups or the community members or the family members were less willing to support or participate in EFIC. Um, and that if they had the family members or the patients had experienced violence, that actually also negatively impacted their support of exception from informed consent. So variables that are actually really important for trauma patients um, uh, for this particular study. We also said, and I mentioned, we had a bunch of questions about like uh, exception from informed consent and would they want to, you know, would they be willing to, et cetera. And so one of the interesting questions that we got was uh, if the family were not available, who would be the best person to consent for you to participate in emergency research? And we wanted to look at what the patients thought, the family thought, and what the community thought. And we got very, very different opinions and beliefs. So if you were the patient or the family, uh, you were more likely to believe that the doctor should be the one who actually makes the decision about whether you should participate in emergency research. Um, or if it wasn't the doctor, then nobody should do it because it wouldn't be right for someone other than my family to consent for me. So it was these very, very different opinions about whether or not um, doing this kind of research would be um, uh, reasonable um, with you know, almost a third of the patients saying that the, the doctor should do it and a third of the patients saying nobody should do it. And this isn't right. If you looked at the community, however, they had a very low belief that the doctor or nobody should be consenting for uh, exception from informed consent research. What they believed instead was that the religious leaders of the community should be the ones who would be uh, giving consent for, on behalf of the patient. So very different beliefs, very different ideas of um, who should be consenting if your family wasn't there. So in another very interesting study, um, they looked at um, these 27 trials uh, that were FDA approved, and they looked at the 42,000 different surveys uh, that were available to review. And these uh, uh, folks, uh, Dr. Feld and Dr. Kelsahem, who I honestly, I don't even think I looked at the, the, the uh, authors until like literally this morning uh, that these uh, illustrious investigators are actually on this panel. Um, they did the study. So uh, 42,000 surveys, these were, um, and they looked at the difference between random digit diet or random, uh, random surveys versus um, convenient sampling. And what they found is that as you sort of went away um, from the community and got more personal, uh, the 
the acceptance of uh, enrollment actually decreased in these emergency studies. So, you know, 86% of the folks thought that they that you could enroll anyone in the community and that would be okay. 73% that they that uh, approved of their own enrollment, but as they got to their family, um, they were less likely to be supportive of it. And in fact, if you actually looked at whether they approved of enrollment without consent, um, almost a little over half of those did not believe that that was actually acceptable. So when they looked at uh, in things that might influence that acceptance, male gender, if you were uh, had enrolled more males in your group, you were less likely to have uh, ethic approval. And if you had more African Americans in your group, they were uh, less likely to support ethic, suggesting both gender and race actually influence your support of exception from informed consent research. There was also a discordance between who was surveyed and who was actually enrolled. And I think Dr. Feldman sort of alluded to that, that they, um, uh, they surveyed a number of folks, um, but there was actually a disproportionate increase in uh, enrollment of people. Um, so, for example, they uh, interviewed uh, they interviewed uh, um, a certain amount of African Americans, but that the percentage was actually much higher, and those were actually enrolled in the studies. Oops, why is this not going now? There we go. So, in another review. It, it goes to this issue of uh, justice and whether or not the burden and the benefit of research is actually shared. And even whether or not exception from informed consent research actually benefits society at all. Um, in this study, uh, they looked at the uh, 29 EFIC trials. Uh, they had nearly 47,000 patients. And what they found was that of those 47,000 patients, 96% were actually enrolled without consent, which is very high and suggests that, um, that we really are relying on not consenting folks um, rather than actually getting, um, trying a very attempting to get uh, consent from family members. And then there was a 1% withdrawal. Again, that seems very low in terms of um, you know, people participating in research. Um, they found that of these 27, 29 studies, only four studies demonstrated any benefit. And five were actually associated with increased harm. And of those groups, one third of the participants were African-Americans, even though the US population of African-Americans is um, roughly 14%. So again, this imbalance of uh, people um, being represented in these studies when they're not actually um, represented by the US population. So is this actually uh, adhering to the principle of justice? So what, you know, what can we do to try to improve the community consultation? Um, there was a summit in 2011 of groups that actually are interested in emergency research. And most recently there was another summit uh, through the National Trauma Research uh, Group. Uh, the report is not out yet, but they were interested in trying to figure out like what do these groups believe and how can we actually do this better to define community? Mm -hmm. Why is this not going? There we go. So what they found at the summit was that the, de the definition of community is very multi-dimensional. Uh, it's not a one size fits all uh, definition and that it's very specific to each site and to the location, the type of study and the location. So who's being studied? What is the patient population? Where is it being done? And all of those factors need to go into how you consider community. They also felt that the segments of community that would be overrepresented or disproportionately enrolled should have a seat at the table and they should be specifically uh, contacted um, with the consultation process. So, for example, in our patient of hemorrhagic shock in, in, at the University of Pennsylvania, where penetrating trauma, we were going to enroll, um, most of the patients ended up being from penetrating trauma. Most of the patients ended up being uh, African American that were young that we um, needed to absolutely over-represent our community consultation and include those folks into the discussion. And importantly, this should really be a discussion. It should be an open-ended two-way conversation with the study, uh, uh, the senior staff or the study PI, and that the community should have the opportunity to uh, give their opinions, ask questions, and influence the design of the trial. And they felt that the, the methods that met this two requirement for two-way communication would be focus groups, 
meetings within the community with leaders and representatives, although I have to say in our study, um, the representatives of the community did not match what the, the patients and their family said, um, and that uh, they recommended in-person interviews. Other methods which are often used, uh, including random digit dialing, surveys that go out to a large group of people, um, and more, um, uh, you know, there's even uh, some studies that have actually looked at social media as a way of interacting with the community to get quote unquote community consultation. Well, those may in fact uh, distribute information to the community or the people who may be involved. It's not really a consultative process. Um, and that these methods should be used as adjuncts rather than the sole uh, method of consultation. So happy to entertain any questions and um, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Carrie, and, and thanks to folks who are who are putting questions in the Q and A. Uh, I am getting them, and we'll I'll turn it over to um, Doctor uh, to to Neil Dicker next. Uh, but maybe we'll we'll sort of take questions all at the end. If that sounds uh, good with you with you guys. Thanks very much for uh, for having me, uh, and and thanks to 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 Carrie for a great uh, uh, first talk, uh, and Will for a really nice uh, introduction to set the stage um, for this. Oops, sorry. Uh, by way of disclosures, I have uh, research funding, uh, much of which relates to um, uh, this content area, uh, and a consulting arrangement with Abiumed related to uh, an EFIC trial. Um, so what I want to do in, in this talk is uh, talk a little bit about sort of where, where have we come very, very briefly, one slide worth, um, and, and, and a little bit more then about uh, where we are going and what we don't know yet about EFIC. So as, as uh, you all have heard, we have now 26 years of experience with the EFIC regulations. As Will mentioned, there was some time beforehand, but really that's when 96 was when these regulations were, were passed, specifically um, setting out the parameters for EFIC and even more specifically um, requiring community engagement. Uh, as Carrie pointed out, we do have an established, but I would say pretty uh, significantly evolving set of tools for community engagement and a significant number of EFIC trials that have been conducted. Uh, as Will highlighted, uh, and I'll show uh, uh, sort of very similar data here, you can see that the, the, the trials uh, that have been done in the EFIC space have really heavily concentrated in cardiac arrest, hemorrhagic shock, and traumatic brain injury. Um, I'll go through what, what I think are some really interesting challenges as we think about situations like uh, stroke, respiratory failure, and acute coronary syndrome as one of the, uh, one of the interesting challenges we're facing uh, in, in, uh, towards the later end of my talk. So um, what I think uh, in, in, in structuring this uh, for, for this session, I thought what might be most interesting was to think about what, I, what, what, what are the real challenges and questions uh, that remain. And I, I would add, I think the, the equity piece is a very interesting one. I didn't focus on it in this talk, but I hope we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that in the context of, um, uh, of discussion, because I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting and important uh, topic. But I, what I wanted to, to focus on here are uh, what three challenges I think are really important. One is how to make community consultation and public disclosure both meaningful and efficient. And Carrie got at some of this in her talk, and I'll talk about some um, uh, some supplementary uh, issues in that space. A second has to do with defining the scope of EFIC regulations and particularly studies that involve a mix of populations who can and can't be involved prospectively. Uh, and then a last is something I think that often doesn't get talked about, um, but really is how best to respect people who are enrolled in EFIC trials. And that's really built on a, what I think is a really important notion that respecting persons goes much beyond autonomy and, and, and thinking about how we execute that is an important area for the work. So, um, so the community consultation, I, you know, this is a, a pretty um, uh, really low budget graph I made a long time ago uh, that, that I still think is helpful. And, and, and Carrie alluded to some of this, but, but it's a really important issue. I think when we think about community consultation, there can be a tension between depth and breadth. 
And that gets to um, really important issues related to representativeness, as well as whether we've really had a chance to hear from people in what's intended to be a two-way uh, interchange. These are absolutely not mathematical locate mathematical uh, uh, notions here, but but I think when you look at the different tools that exist, some have a really good potential to reach a large portion of the community. Others will be small, but in the, in being small, they also offer opportunities for having a much more substantive discussion. And the kinds of information you tend to get are going to be very different in those different kinds of encounters. And I think thinking carefully about what we're trying to get out of community consultation is really, really important. It's very easy to focus on numbers, um, both acceptance numbers and demographic numbers and other kinds of numbers uh, and, and lose sight uh, uh, of, of whether you're engaging in substantive discussion. The social media space, I think, is actually a really interesting one in this way. I put that on, if, if you can make a big circle um, that's one where I think uh, you know social media has so many different potential ways to engage people, and we're just beginning, I think, to scratch the surface of ways to use that. This is a a, a, a graph that is a, a little bit related to to the uh, something that um, was shown earlier. Uh, it, it's adapted from a, a, a table in a paper that we published looking at acceptance, and I'm going to get into a, a couple of what what I think are sort of nuanced issues that that Carrie also raised. When you look at um, the surveys that are published uh, related to community consultation, there's a, there's a sort of trend basically between the mid 60s and the low 80s um, in terms of the percent of people who tend to agree with it being okay to be enrolled in the study if they were in that situation. So usually these are phrased related to personal acceptance. And you can see there is a, there's a range, but there's a very clear clustering um, in that sort of space. And that tends to get repeated over and over and over again. Um, but what I think is interesting is, especially when people are focusing on, um, uh, on uh, uh, acceptance, it does matter, as, as Carrie suggested and showed the paper from the, the work that Will and, and colleagues had published, these are different ways of asking questions. So this is just from a, a, a study we did that was embedded within a large traumatic brain injury trial. And I think it's helpful to put a little meat on the bones of what it means to ask people these different kinds of questions. Um, so one is, you know, would you be okay being enro enrolled in this study without consent? That's what we, we call in, in, in the papers that we've published in this space, personal acceptance. A second one is about, you know, is it okay to include patients in the PROTECT study without consent? So that's a general thing about other people. Um, and then there's a, you know, if you look above that, uh, it's acceptable to test this medication in traumatic brain injury patients. So that's just a general question in, gen you know, a very general one. So depending on how you phrase the question and anyone who does anything related to survey uh, work, uh, depending on how you phrase the question, you get different answers. And I think that really matters when we try to put things together. And, and you know, people who are Clinical trialists in the EFIC space are generally not necessarily survey experts, right? So, so, so it's a basket of lots of different ways to ask questions and make it a bit of a hard, um, a hard uh, a nut to crack in terms of what to expect. Um, this is the, the the piece that again, um, Carrie showed this slide from from Will's review of the FDA docket data, and and I think it's important to recognize that these really are asking fundamentally different questions. Um, about general acceptability, about uh, uh, family member enrollment, which often isn't even with, uh, with, that, with or without consent. It's, these, these are very different kinds of questions and people uh, often in the context of doing this may or may not be real precise about what they're really getting at. So um, I think uh, it raises really interesting questions in part uh, because we don't always know what to do with numbers that you get, right? What does it mean that 68% of people said okay? That's still, you know, 32 people, 32% of people who didn't say okay. Um, and then at times you get, you know, studies that show 92% of people say okay, and we all know there are more than 8% of people who might not say that. How, uh, how to interpret this, what kinds of thresholds ought to be used, I think raises real questions. But more importantly, I think it raises important questions about whether the goal of community consultation is really a quantitative representation of acceptance. 
I think there are numerous other uses that may be that community consultation can be put toward. One of which, for example, is design, helping to design or frame uh, communication or consent materials, really thinking about how you're going to execute the study, particularly if you're in an interactive discussion. And I think we need to think more broadly than just it's not community consent, it's not a vote. Um, it is really uh, substantively engaging people about an activity that you think is important to conduct. I think the second piece that's, you know, with regard to sort of subtlety aspects of community consultation is thinking about context specificity and the extent to which the requirements for engagement really are uh, impacted by things like the level of risk, the extent to which the interventions depart from normal care or not. These are a lot of really subtle aspects that I think can go into how extensive we want to be uh, uh, or need to be in community consultation efforts, but there's a lot of room in the regulatory space for that. And I think IRBs struggle a lot with regard to how to address those issues. One of the things that's coming, uh, that's happening now that I think is actually quite promising and interesting is this phenomenon of single IRB oversight of locally conducted uh, activities, right? Community consultation always will be done at a local level in some way. You're supposed to talk to the people in the geographic area where you're going to be doing the study. But when you're a central IRB and you're seeing, you know, 45 different sites, you actually gain really interesting insights across sites. Um, you see which ones actually represent uh, ab uh, aberrations um, that might warrant further work. Uh, you have the ability to contextualize findings that a local place doesn't. Um, and you also don't have, you know, many local conventions are just that. They're local conventions because that's what they've gotten used to doing. Um, and single IRB offers a way to be uh, a, a bit more uh, potentially standardized if that's appropriate. The flip side is that single IRBs overseeing uh, locally conducted uh, activities may or may not have as much of a finger on the pulse of the local community. So with regard to the public disclosure piece, right, that's the other arm of the community engagement, and that's explicitly intended to be more of a sort of one-way communication, right? That's about notifying people of what's going to happen. This, I think there's a lot of questions about. Number one, there's no regulatory basis for determining sufficiency. We struggle with that with regard to community consultation, but I think it's even more nebulous with regard to, to, uh, to public disclosure. Community consultation, we're basically trying to get a good sense of what we think the key stakeholders think. For public disclosure, there's no, there's no real conceptual basis, even beyond thinking that people have put forth a good faith effort. Uh, we know that in the best of circumstances, it's almost impossible that, that any really appreciable portion of a community is ever going to be aware of an individual trial being conducted in their area. And so figuring out how to judge sufficiency is very difficult. Sometimes people get confused about the distinctions between community consultation and public disclosure. Some efforts can do uh, can serve both functions. Carrie mentioned the fact that large surveys, for example, will in will end up notifying a large number of people, and that's certainly true. That that efforts can serve both functions, but thinking about them separately and recognizing what they do and don't do is really important. Uh, and I, I personally think that the, the impact of public disclosure practices uh, is very hard to measure. Uh, and, 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 and really, um, you know, this, this idea makes sense and we need to be transparent. Uh, but what exactly we're getting with the public disclosure activities, I think, is important to assess. So I want to switch now um, to an issue that, uh, that, that I think has been alluded to a little bit. Um, and this is about uh, defining the scope of EFIX. This is what I what I really think is a, a second big challenge related to EFIC research, and one that often hasn't been recognized. Right. So this is this is like the uh, the picture of the study that Will presented. Like the ALP study was looking at you know what drug is being given in the context of cardiac arrest. Um, uh, and and you know obviously that the the guy with the paddles is not going to consent the person uh, that 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 is actively um, in cardiac arrest, but this guy um, is a little different, right? So this is a guy that uh, you know I'm a cardiologist, so I have to show a picture of someone having chest pain. It's like part of what I'm supposed to do. Um, but this is th these are the kind of people that I take care of who are having a heart attack and. Um, you know, in, in Will or Carrie's space in acute respiratory failure or trauma, we also see patients like this who are in distress um, uh, and they can talk to us and we might have a very time sensitive intervention that needs to get delivered. Um, and some patients may look more like him and some patients may be more or, or less responsive. 
So, so there's a wide range of people with acute presentations and, and a wide range of interventions that have different kinds of time pressures. People have different kinds of symptoms that could get away or get in the way of their being involved uh, with a decision. There's high levels of stress. Different conditions have variable levels of neurologic impairment. And obviously, the lack of familiarity with research we know is pervasive. The other thing that I think is really important to recognize is surrogates in acute care situations face a lot of the same barriers. So, um, so there really are, I think, a, a wide range of situations um, where we face um, that are high stakes situations and we have acutely ill patients that need immediate treatment. And I gave an example of some of these things, but it includes septic shock, acute MI, cardiogenic shock, trauma. Um, and these can span context from the pre-hospital environment to the emergency department to ICUs and ORs and cath labs. Uh, as Will mentioned, uh, these are uh, the, the, there's a there's a variety of settings, a variety of time sensitivity, um, and uh, and different kinds of milieus in which uh, studies that plausibly fall under EFIC uh, are going to be conducted. Um, and I think it's important as we're as we're seeing, you know, this clustering of of work in the cardiac arrest, traumatic brain injury, uh, and major hem uh, particularly um, uh, hemorrhagic trauma. Um, have been the focus of a lot of this work, but it really applies to a very broad range of clinical situations. And, you know, the EFIC regulations, interestingly, uh, do have something to say about this, and it's important, but there's a lot that they don't say. So what the regulations do say about, um, about this issue is that we are supposed to get consent. We're required to get consent if a patient's capacitated or an LAR is available and capacitated. And interestingly, there's a requirement that gets doesn't get much airplay, but I think is really interesting that we're supposed to offer an opportunity to object to enrollment in cases where consent isn't possible, but someone's available. So it's like an opportunity to say no, even if a, cons a real consent process can't take place. Um, and, 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 and the third piece that, that it's been described by my colleagues is that the, the study obviously can't be practicably uh, done when enrolling only subjects who can provide consent or who have an LER who could do this. So, so what's left kind of unstated uh, is what this threshold should be for practicability. Uh, what does it mean that you can't do the study only enrolling subjects who can provide consent? How many people have to not be able to provide consent for the study then to either not be uh, doable from a time perspective or not be doable from a scientific perspective where you can't generalize to the population that you want to be able to generalize to? Those, those boundaries are not well-defined. And there's a lot of questions, I think, about what it means to communicate with people in a way that's that I would say is uh, short of consent, but where you offer people an opportunity uh, to object. So, so in terms of thinking about this, I think you know we don't we, we we have this notion of what a full informed consent process is supposed to look like, but we don't have a great uh, notion of what a sort of partial involvement or opportunity to object should look like. We don't have really fully uh, worked out criteria about who ought to be offered an opportunity to object. And that can raise interesting issues about a friend that's there or uh, um, you know, somebody who may not be a formal, a formal LAR. And we don't really know much about what patients or surrogates actually want to happen in these kinds of situations. And as a, as a cardiologist who takes care of these patients, interestingly, one of the things that motivated me to do some empirical work in this space is I, I thought that must be a terrible thing to be in a situation where you're not really, you can't really be told much about something and you have to make a decision about an unfamiliar activity like research. So, so we actually asked people, um, not in the context of an EFIC trial, but in the context of stroke and MI trials, so uh, where people had to be enrolled very quickly. And, and some people would argue EFIC may actually be the right paradigm. Um, but we, we, we were curious, uh, and I'll, I'll just say, uh, I didn't show it in this slide, but many people enrolled in these trials, this was a little while afterwards, had very little idea of what they actually were enrolled in. That's just, I think, an important thing for us to recognize in acute settings, people um, have a hard time understanding complicated information. What I think was really interesting though, is that most people in both stroke and MI trials, and in the stroke case, this was usually a surrogate who was asked to make a decision. Most people were glad they were asked um, before a patient was included. Uh, not that many people were angry about having to sign a form. 
Uh, and most people didn't think um, that they would have preferred if the doctor treating them had made the decision for me. We similarly did a study um, that was using a general public sample that was built on a, a, a trial that was conducted in the UK that was uh, that actually did enroll people under under their version of it, of EFIC, and, and this was patients coming in with acute myocardial infarction where they were just being randomized to one of two uh, blood thinners, basically, and asked them, you, you can sort of split this into group A and group B, um, about whether they wanted to be uh, give written consent versus being notified after enrollment, so, sort of for an EFIC um, uh, 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 kind of setup. Or in the second group, they were asked, would they want written consent or, or sort of a brief verbal consent? And without dissecting this too much, I think what you can see is people were kind of split on the notion of, um, of, of written consent versus a notification after enrollment. And in general, people preferred a sort of brief focus process versus written consent. So, so I think these, these and other data, this is just two examples of studies, I think that suggest we, we, we should, and uh, the regulations support doing this, we need to figure out how to involve people even in situations where we know they won't have full understanding. Um, and, and I think that's actually really promising. I, I started with this notion of thinking that people would be really angry at that idea. They'd be asked about something they couldn't possibly understand. In reality, I think people uh, appreciate being asked and take it as a sign of respect that they're asked, um, uh, even if uh, their engagement in the full decision is, is because of the circumstances, not possible. Um, so the, the last piece that I want to focus on uh, is, is this notion of, of respecting enrollees, because I think there's a lot about um, that's there about acceptance of, um, uh, uh, of, of EFIC trials from the kind of community consultation perspective, which are by definition not people who have been enrolled in the trial. Uh, we have gathered some data on looking at the differences between people who have experience with the disease and people who don't. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about some of those data in the discussion. Uh, but what I think I wanna focus on here are really the experiences of actually being in an EFIC trial. It's surprising how little data we have from that. I'll share some of that in just a second. Uh, but learning what we can do to make that better and to help uh, people uh, feel respected in a process where we don't have opportunities to enroll them prospectively, I think is really important. So, um, so one of the first studies I did uh, when I was uh, on, on faculty and actually started as a fellow was in, to embed some work within ongoing EFIC trials and actually talk to people uh, who were enrolled. And this, th th these are just a, a snapshot of some data that came from the PROTECT-3 trial, which was a trial of traumatic brain injury. It was a placebo-controlled trial of progesterone um, in this space. Um, and, and you can see, so, so just looking at the core questions, the first one uh, asked, do you think it was okay uh, for researchers to include me or my family uh, member in the PROTECT-3 research study without asking uh, for permission first? Uh, and you get 77% of people uh, saying, okay. Uh, uh, and then we asked this more general question of, do you think it was okay for researchers to include people in the PROTECT-3 study without asking them for permission? So more of a, gen a kind of a general question, it's not personal. In this particular case, there wasn't that big a difference, uh, but in, the, in the, the community consultation questions, there often are. Importantly, when you don't sort of really focus on the consent piece, most people uh, were pretty accepting uh, of having been enrolled in the trial. What I think is really important from this is it shows that at least with regard to people's reactions post hoc, I think two things. One, the level of the number of people who were upset about that. Now, obviously, we can't talk to everybody in this study. Um, the number of people who are really upset is, uh, is not super large, um, but it's there. Um, and the numbers of people who say okay to having been enrolled is actually quite similar to what we see in community consultation efforts. Um, this is uh, a, another study we did that was a much more quantitatively representative study within an ESET, within the ESET trial, which was a trial of status epilepticus, and everyone who essentially was in that study uh, had, had the opportunity to fill out uh, this survey. And, and this was um, asking, I think, importantly different questions. So one, just was it okay to include them in the study? 77% have said yes. And I think what really is key is the number who disagreed more so than the number who uh, were neutral. So 13% of this population um, uh, were sort of not excited about having been included. 
Um, and then when you when you sort of focus in or hone in on the notion of asking for permission first, obviously those numbers shift a little bit. So I, so I think that's an important thing to think about again from a from a methodologic perspective, which one matters the most. My my own view is what matters the most is is the first question of whether people were really upset by it um, more than when we sort of specifically hone in uh, on questions about consent. That's a that's an important methodologic issue, I think. Um, so, so I think knowing that this happens and knowing um, sort of what that, that there are a number of people who have concerns and that there are a lot of people who may not, I think it's important that we need to, to you know, we as a field kind of turn our efforts into what we can do to enhance the extent to which people feel respected, right? No, almost none of the scholarship in this space has ever focused on how to optimize communications afterwards beyond uh, things like the fact that we have to get consent for continued participation or data use. No one's really studied um, how best to approach a family member and tell them that they've been, uh, or a patient and tell that they've been included in an EFIC trial. We don't know what they want in terms of um, uh, subsequent information about the study, how that should be presented in ways that help them to understand it. Um, and I would say also help them to understand the value of what, uh, of what happened. Um, but I think one of the promising avenues for community consultation is actually to help develop um, some of these strategies. One of the criticisms of community consultation is that it's almost never resulted in any study uh, not being done, right? It, they, 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 they generally go forward with a set of data about um, how many people say yes, um, or how many people say, say it's okay, but, um, but it usually doesn't alter the way a study's uh, done. I think if we think about using community consultation to help to, to enhance communication strategies and treat it as a genuine form of engagement about how to do the study the best way you can, we actually might learn a little bit more and have some things that would be more directly uh, implementable. So, um, so where do we stand? Um, hopefully we can talk about that in the discussion. I think we have a significant accumulated experience conducting these trials. I think there's a lot that we've learned and a lot of ways that they can uh, that they can happen very effectively. I think there are important challenges related to the scope of EFIC and how to uh, approach perspective involvement. I didn't talk about this um, specifically, and I should mention it now. Many of the studies that are done. So, so I know the the the. Um, you know, Carrie described the, the piece from the FDA docket data that, that um, Will and colleagues uh, reviewed. A lot of those did involve, a, a large portion of people were um, uh, enrolled without prospective consent, but there are a number of trials where, um, where uh, a substantial portion of people are enrolled with consent. So a mixed, uh, a mixed pattern that is not about sites, but is actually just about a mixed population uh, I think is the norm, or is maybe not the norm in some conditions, but is in many conditions, and is going to become uh, a, a more common thing for people to think about. Um, we need to have uh, clarity, I think, regarding the goals and best strategies for both community consultation and public disclosure. And I think there's a lot of spaces in which um, that hasn't always been done in ways that are particularly efficient or meaningful. Um, and I think we really do need to shift our turn, our, 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 our eyes towards what it is to, uh, to really try to enhance uh, respect for individuals um, who are enrolled. I think in general, you know, the, uh, I was glad to see Carrie mentioned the, the, the principle of respect for persons. Um, and I think a, a more holistic understanding of what it is to respect people, and we've done some empirical work on this too, uh, involves a lot more than just whether they can say yes or no. Uh, and, and thinking about how to interact meaningful and meaningfully and respectfully is really important. So uh, I just, uh, this just lists a lot of our collaborators. We've done a number of projects in this space over the years, um, and it's been a pleasure to work on, uh, on that with them. Thank you so much, uh, Neil and Carrie. Just really terrific um, talks, highlighting so many difficult issues. And um, we have a ton of folks on this call, and we have gotten a ton of very, very challenging questions. So I'm going to uh, try to <laughs> synthesize these as best we can and, and sort of move through them in an orderly way. But um, a lot of these are really, really hard questions that I think we all um, scratch our heads over. So the first set of questions that I'll, I'll put to both of you has to do with kind of definitions and terminology. So one person asked specifically about this distinction between community consent versus community consultation. And if, if you all could 
speak more about that if, if community consent is ever sort of an appropriate way to think about this um, or, or how you distinguish the two. Um, a second definitional point had to do with the use of the words enrollees rather than subjects. And this, um, I think somebody picked up on the fact, Neil, that you were re referring to enrollees and, and, and not subjects and sort of what, what the right language is here. Uh, and then um, a third question that I'll kind of lump with this in this category is we, we have all mentioned how community consultation and public disclosure happened before the trial. And then there's there's sort of disclosure afterwards. But what about during a trial? Is there um, what, what activities are happening during a trial? I, I guess I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, uh, I'll see if I can, maybe, maybe I'll answer one or two of those questions. Carrie can pick up on others or add to it. But with regard to the consent piece, uh, I think that's that's pretty straightforward. The, the regulations and guidance are, are, are very clear that this is not a community consent process, right? This is not a, there's no, this isn't a vote. Um, uh, I think at the same time, if you were to find overwhelming opposition, um, you know, I think most people would say it's, it becomes difficult to justify what, what I think, so so, um, so it's intended to be a consultative process where you're engaging in discussion um, and you listen, you take seriously what, what people tell you. Um, so it isn't, it is not community consent um, in large part because most of these communities are not defined communities with hierarchical structures of decision-making, right? There's not, that doesn't exist. There, there isn't a body you're going to in most of these cases. So it, so it is not like, um, like certain kinds of the term community consent tends to exist when you have more uh, sort of decision making kind of hierarchies and structures you can go to. So that's not that's not it. Um, the subject enrollee thing is interesting. I I, I don't know whether I um, you know I think sometimes a lot can be made of, of of that distinction. I didn't intend to make a lot of that distinction. Um, they th these are people who may or may not have it, have chosen to enroll. Um, you know, I, they are subjects in an experiment, you know, in, in, a, in an experiment or study that that is that is absolutely true. Um, and, um, you know, we are they're also patients who are critically ill um, and family members of patients who are critically ill that we need to treat with humanity and um, and engage them in that way. So and many of them, if they're followed up, they are they become enrollees of the study. Right. That, that's that's an important um, that's an important issue. And, and maybe Carrie uh, or either of you just on this question of, of kind of activities related to public disclosure or community consultation as the trial has begun. I, it's not something I've thought about, but it's an interesting thing to ask about. I'm curious if you all have thoughts about that. So I, I think I love the idea, actually, uh, about uh, ongoing community consultation and information. Um, I think it's hard to have that. Uh, it would probably be more of the disclosure as opposed to the consultation aspect of it, because I, I think it's intended that the consultation actually does inform the researchers about how they're going to conduct the research. Um, so if you're changing your experiment, uh, you know, midway, that poses a lot of problems. Um, but, you know, informing the community that you're doing this is actually super helpful. Um, for our ongoing public disclosure for the avert shock trial, we had this huge poster in the emergency department. So anybody who came into the emergency department who was there for any reason, um, you know, a foot fracture or, you know, true trauma or, you know, a heart attack, anybody in the emergency department could see that we were doing this research and had it all laid about, about what we're doing, what the background was, how it was going to go down. We gave out flyers to our patients um, when they were admitted to the uh, trauma uh, for any reason. They got a flyer to just describe all of the research that we were doing in our division. Um, but we did not go out, you know, more toward the community and sort of continue to meet with people and talk to them about what we were doing. But I do, I do really like that idea a lot um, and should be something that people should consider doing. Not as consultative, because I think you can't change the experiment, but from a ongoing public disclosure. And I think it would actually, that idea would actually um, foster a lot of trust between 
the at least geographic community and the institution that was doing this kind of research. One of the things we found when we were going on and meeting with the focus groups and as well as the patients was that um, families, patients, and community don't really realize that we just we don't just treat people. We actually try to advance science and improve the way we care for people. Um, and so it was actually an educational opportunity as well about like, this is this is what our institution does. We don't just care for you. We want to make sure this never happens again, that we continue to try to save your life in different ways. Yeah, I th th this point is really important. Um, I, just to add on to that, what, what one of the things that, that's within what Carrie said that I think is just incredibly important we, we think about this as isolated to an individual study, but but it, I really think the right way to think about all of this is as a, as the way that an institution and, and a set of researchers relate to the community. And it, it, it goes over different projects, it spans different conditions. This is about how we interact with people, um, about how we make progress in medicine. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it we, the, the way it's structured, it's it's all about an individual study, but it's really it's really about much more than that. If we take a bigger picture view, and um, and I think for the most part, most investigators would love more opportunity for their work to be more public. I don't think there's anybody out there doing studies where they're trying to hide anything, right? They they want they want the the discussion, and 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 you talk to many people in this space, and they're like, I couldn't get the newspaper to cover it. I couldn't get interviewed on TV. I couldn't get anyone to talk to me on radio. You know, it's um, I think I, I think people want that, so I, I I think it's they're open to it. Um, in a related vein, one one person asked to hear more about this, the wristbands and the experience with, with opt-out wristbands that both of you alluded to. One question had come up in the chat about, should there be opt-in wristbands rather than opt-out wristbands? And another about how, um, how it could be improved, this idea of, of opt-out wristbands. But uh, you know, as both of you mentioned, they are many trials or all trials give them out, but they aren't giving out that many. And it's not clear in, in many cases how many there are giving out or if folks are actually showing up ever with the wristband on and are therefore being excluded from trials. So just if I, you know, either or both of you could speak to the wristband uh, question. So the, uh, I, I think this is a really great question. Uh, so the opt-out wristbands, um, you advertise them and then people don't pick them up or don't ask for them. And those that do ask for them um, really do not want to be in your trial. So you know that from the beginning. The I think the challenge with um, doing the opt-in um, is that these disease processes are not predictable. So um, if they were predictable, then you would be able to go out to those groups and sort of advertise your study and get enrollment um, in advance, uh, uh, which is one of the requirements for EFIC. You, um, so it's you have no way of predicting, uh, for example, who's going to suffer some of these emergency events. And if you if if we have the opt out and it's poorly attended, you can imagine how poorly uh, enrolled the opt in would be as well. Um, so I think it just adds to the impracticality of the whole research. So uh, I don't think we would get any of it done from a practical perspective. Now, does that make it ethically? murky, possibly, um, but it does make it uh, almost assuredly that you will not get your study done. Yeah, yeah, I, I would just say I, I, I agree 100%. I, I, I don't think it makes it ethically challenging in the sense that there's just no way you can possibly reach. Um, you, the, you look at what, what most people don't know about what's happening in, in, in the world and to think that we have any realistic expectation of making most people aware of, a, of an individual study um, is just, is I think, not practicable. The other thing with regard to the opt-out piece, right? I mean, you, you can imagine if we really rely, or you, you, you could imagine people having like a long, if you're in a place that does a lot of emergency research, you're like your whole arm's gonna be covered with opt-out bracelets. Um, and these things are really hard. Some people have said, should we have a blanket? You know, don't include me ever in emergency research. I don't think offering people something like that is also, um, I think if anybody were enrolling and they saw that, they wouldn't do it, right? You wouldn't enroll someone who said that and that would be appropriate. Um, but but the idea of really trying to promote kind of blanket research refusals when it's really a contextual and, and, and not related to the study or the condition, 
Um, I, I don't think that's productive. I think what we what we do we we have a burden of communication and and I think appropriate oversight um, to 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 be trustworthy, right? I think we just have to own it. Right? We 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 we're, as institutions, as investigators, as ethicists, we have to own that we're taking a big responsibility by doing a trial that enrolls people without their prospective consent. Um, and 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 really take that seriously. I think also if you look at um, you know one one thing that has given me sort of in, encouragement, I guess, is that when you look at the people who were enrolled and you ask them, are you glad you were enrolled in this trial? Overwhelmingly, people are. Um, yeah. In our study for the avert shock trial, we enrolled um, 100 patients and contacted every one of their families at some point within that time. Um, some patients made it, some patients didn't make it. Um, and only one family member actually withdrew consent uh, when we, we approached them. So, I mean, that's a remarkable enrollment. And I think what it goes to show is that there is, despite what we say, there is some trust between the medical community and the, um, the patients that we serve. Um, and that in fact, people, when they are in, uh, uh, in these emergency situations, they really do want um, either standard of care, which is the placebo part of this, or they want something better that we think might be better. Um, and, and so I think that there is um, there is that trust. Yeah, that, that's right. I agree with you 100%. I think that the piece that was most that, that we wanted to focus on when like within the ESET, for example, was the the people that that disagreed with being enrolled, not necessarily people who are neutral or agree. It's really what we want to know is if people are upset, why are they upset, right? It, what made that experience something that they didn't want to happen? Um, and and you know, from other studies we've done, it might not have anything to do with consent. It might not actually even have anything to do with the study, right? I think we really need to start to study what that is and see what's addressable because there may be communication barriers we could help to. To demonstrate trustworthiness and tell people what went into the study rather than you know and correct misperceptions right there, there's a lot of ways that i think um we can we can help and there's no regulatory component to that either right i mean there's lots of ways we can communicate uh, and we can find ways to be effective in that one person asked about the 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 a concern of survivorship bias that it you know for interviewing people afterwards who made it um then uh are we is, is are we are we doing it right and, and a question that i have for you all is um sort of what, the, the research out there on interviewing families after the fact when when it's you know folks uh when it's a loved one who who passed away and if if there's you know sort of good data on families versus versus um the person who actually experienced the 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 event himself or herself I we did so we did that in our study so first of all you know, in our group we we um for the protect study it wasn't just people who uh, we we interviewed whoever made the whoever was was initially contacted as the person we talked to and in many cases particularly in traumatic brain injury study the, the patient's not eligible to be included we talked to the patient when the patient was alive if uh, and available if the patient was not was neither alive nor available we talked to family members and and most of those in that study that we talked to were family members and 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 many of them had people that that didn't survive um so there's clearly a bias in our sample in some ways that i don't know how big it was because a lot of it's not response but but you know um i can tell you from that kind of study people had different kinds of responses right i i, I they're, they're, they're very salient statements of people who um, had uh, loved ones that passed away um, who said, well, I hope that we learned something from this, or I'm glad they had a chance to, to try every potential therapy, right? I mean, so, so, I mean, you can imagine, and whether those are super well-informed or not, you know, uh, it, 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 is, is, it matters, but, but I think their experiences are what we were trying to study. And, and, and many of them, I think, found value in that process, especially if it's communicated well. Uh, one one question to to pivot a little bit uh, had to do with um, the the idea of anonymity in in community consultation, and so um, you had that that nice graph up, Neil, of of sort of the the different ways in which the the sort of depth of of conversation you might have with with a one on one interview being sort of the you know, kind of having quite a lot of depth. And this person was asking about social media, and and I wonder what you think about. 
social media at, as a, on the one hand, having some anonymity uh, may, may be good. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you may not have the, the kind of uh, depth of a, of a back and forth that really gets into a person's uh, sort of personal history and views as well. So I'm curious what you all think about that. I, I think I, I mean I, I guess the question is like um, what what is the what is it that you're trying to to get at exactly um, and often like it's I think usually in the context of these uh, community consultations you want to explain to the community um, what the study is exactly and sometimes just if you do that from a written perspective i'm not sure that people actually get it because there's no opportunity to ask a question so i think i think you'll get answers you'll get some information the the question though would be is it truly an informed conversation um, because there's no opportunity to ask for clarify clarifying questions and there's no um, opportunity for the researcher to um, to probe hesitancies or to um, make sure that there are, are no miscommunications. So I, I like it in the sense it would really fill the public disclosure. I think anonymous surveys are helpful for the disclosure. You will get some information. You may get um, broad swaths of uh, you know information, but the, again, the context and, and the question, how the question is phrased, you know, what it, it just poses a lot of issues in my mind. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think the key is to understand uh, for people thinking about the social media piece that 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 this is not a that this is a very heterogeneous set of strategies, right? And and some of which has really been developed in the context of of COVID, where people had to move forward with things and couldn't have in person meetings, right? So so if you're doing a Facebook Live session with uh, you know members of a particular group, that's a, that's a substantive discussion that can happen. If you're if you're saying I've consulted you know eighty thousand people who have clicked on a website once and nobody had an objection so they think that's okay like that's you know we we know that's garbage right <laughs> and, and and people accidentally clicking on things doesn't necessarily constitute um, real notification right so so I think um, I think there's subtle uses of this there's probably a whole lot of tools that could be really powerful. Um, you know, one thing I've seen some people do, for example, are, you know, focus groups are hard to do, right? They're labor intensive. Not everybody has the expertise to do this. You can do that remotely and do it virtually and, and have actually people who are more qualified to do a focus group, moderate a focus group in an online format, and you might be able to reach people that you couldn't reach if you were doing in-person focus groups. That's not social media, but, but this notion of uh, th there are new tools um, and there's lots of ways, I think Carrie's exactly right, that you just need to think about what you're trying to get out of it um, and, 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 and whether the method is suitable to the goals. I, I really do like the 2011 recommendations um, from the emergency medicine group because it really does provide this concept that the consultation should be a two-way communication. Um, and then if you want to couple that with an anonymous survey um, that people get afterwards and they can turn in the information without being identified in any way, um, then I think you might get some real uh, information. Uh, for our trial, we did give out surveys. They were you know they were all collected they were anonymized uh, uh in that respect whether f folks felt they were anonymous uh might be different um but but i think really looking at the the heart of what the community consultation is supposed to be and it's supposed to be um a a a, a, a consultive moment where you talk to the patient or the, the community, the community talks to you, it says give and take, you learn what their values are, you, you, you get clarification. And I think when we don't do that, when we just do random digit dialing or we do like these you know, very surveyed approaches, I, I think that we miss out uh, on what might be valuable to the community. And then if, it, if we're not really listening, are we then really, um, I mean, it's not consent. I don't want to get that confused, but and it's not really substantive judgment. But there's something very valuable, and I'm not sure what the word is. Maybe Dr. Tucker or, or Dr. Feldman knows, but that there's something very valuable in that interaction, and I think we need to preserve that as much as possible. I have a very thoughtful colleague who describes the, 
what he sees is a lot of the value of the community consultation process is just having to put yourself in front of people and and it's like a mirror, right? You you want to be able to ask people for consent and this is what you want to be able to do. And you need to be able to describe what you want to do. I mean, all of us who have been clinicians, that it's one thing to talk in the background about something, but presenting people with different kinds of choices and having to stand in front of someone and say, you look, you know, your your loved one's very sick and we want to randomly assign them to one arm or the other. Like that's you need to be you need to be ready to do like the, the, the process itself, I think, makes you think about what you're doing and makes you understand the humanity of the people you're interacting with. And and you can lose that if you don't, if you're not present in some way. There's lots of ways to be present, but but I think that's important. So um, one one just last quick question before we we shift gears a little bit. But um, one person who is an e who, who who does EFIC studies is on the the call, and um, actually something that came out of their community consultation process was the idea of having a registry for opting out that they would then check, you know, against the registry when when whenever anybody was was um, enrolled in, was he, uh, this person was just asking how common that is and whether you all see that as a as a maybe a, a better step as opposed to Neil, your sort of wristbanded up person, yeah. you know, with, with like 10 wristbands on and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that process of a registry actually for the PROTECT trial, that grew out of community consultation. It was one of the few, one of the things that the actionable items that came out as people asked, could you do that? Um, and so that was established for that trial. And, and I don't know whether the person who's asking was affiliated with that trial or with others and, and probably has come up out of other community consultation sessions too. Um, I, the, the biggest thing is it depends on the study, right? So you, you're doing a study like ALPS where you're randomly assigning people who are being resuscitated in the field to, to different things. That's not, that's not doable. You don't even know their name half the time when you're, when you're doing that. Um, in contrast, if you're doing a study where, you know, it's emergency department based and you've got an hour or so between the time that, um, you know, that you first have an interaction and when they might actually receive a study intervention, you, you, you may have that opportunity. So I think it's super context specific as to whether a registry is a workable solution. We probably have to promise people, we can't promise that you can always know it. Um, but there certainly are studies where it, if it fits with the therapeutic window to check a registry, then I think people, um, there's a number of cases in which that's been done. It just doesn't always fit. Um, so shifting gears, we, we had some questions around equity and around um, some of the, the sort of ways in which, uh, especially black patients and one person asked specifically about young black men, um, you know, which, which Carrie alluded to in, in uh, one of the trauma trials. And, and just, you know, if, if we could talk a little bit more about where to go and and um, sort of what maybe the EFIC trialist should be doing differently. What the what what the key issues are when it comes to equity. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I you know I think I think you know again um, we we want to um, over consult the groups that have are likely to be. Uh, enrolled so that we get their opinions. And I think for our trial, we consulted all trauma patients. Uh, we had, you know, we could predict potentially who might be more likely to be enrolled in our trial just based on our geography and mechanism for large volume blood loss. Um, you know, at, in uh, West Philadelphia, that happens to be uh, young men who were shot. Um, so you know, because we enrolled more young African Americans who were shot, um, they were the people who were presenting with the disease process. In retrospect, what I wish we had done is not uh, done our uh, community consultation with, um, you know, the, the, the studying the tra trauma patients, the families, and the community. Um, I wish what we had done is look at the trauma patients who were victims of gun violence, um, the family members who were victims of gun violence and community members who lived in the geographic community, because I think that would have given us a better representation. Um, that being said, you know, I think that when we looked at the, the people who did continue enrollment, uh, we only had one participant's family members decline continued uh, participation that wasn't an African American guy that was a, 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 a gentleman who was in a motor vehicle crash. Um, so, you know, I think that um, representation matters. Um, what I think we need to be very careful about is if the study happens to be on traumatic brain injury, and we know that the most likely participant in this trial is going to be, you know, old men who fall, 
uh, old white men who fall that we don't over enroll old African American men who fall like we really try to figure out who is the patient population who's going to be um, enrolled in that study and then target in a very focused way the community consultation to include not only the geography but the patients who will be enrolled and I, then I think we will be uh, really trying to adhere more to the principle of justice. So I, I think this is such an interesting area and one that is more complex than maybe it gets credit for. Um, so I, I, for example, am part of a network to increase diversity in clinical trial participation in cardiovascular disease, right? We have a historic problem of under-enrollment of underrepresented uh, uh, populations. Uh, and in the EFIC space, the, the criticism um, that, that, you know, that, that Will, you and others have raised is maybe we're over-enrolling. Um, so it's a funny, it's a, it's a funny um, tension that we're, that we're facing with regard to, with regard to enrollment here. I, I personally think, it, the, the other piece I would say is that when you look at historic, there's some really interesting historical cases. There's a, a, a TBI trial that was happening before and after the EFIC regs were enacted. Before the EFIC regulations were enacted, they were enrolling basically all white patients. I, I may get the numbers wrong. And then after the EFIC regulations, they basically enrolled whoever went came through the door, which was whoever came through the door. Other and other, uh, and that became much more racially diverse. Other studies that have looked at individual the participation to prevalence ratio at sites where that's been looked at. EFIC is sort of an equalizer in the sense that it, it enrolls whoever comes through the door with the condition, right? It's not selective. There's not issues about differential um, uh, refusal. The, the issue, I think, and I think what you guys found in your paper, Will, is, is probably less about the EFIC mechanism as it is about where we're doing studies, right? We tend to be doing studies at sites that are, you know, major urban centers, and 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 this is the kind of so so I actually I I, I don't know what what you guys thoughts are, but but my view is that's actually not a problem with EFIC, that's a problem with site selection, um, and I think we need to be careful about that because we don't want this to be um, about the mechanism. It's it's about the it's about who does research and where we do it. Um, that that probably isn't that in many ways is not intentionally discriminatory, but it's it's where it's where for, for a whole host of reasons, it's where research tends to get clustered. Um, so I, I personally don't think it's really the mechanism. The other piece I would say is with regard to the engagement, I worry that people that are really focused on um, representativeness and community consultation can be over counters. And if we focus on the quantitative representation of who's there rather than the quality of who we're talking to and whether we're really legitimately hearing underrepresented voices, then we could miss the boat in a big way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and and I, I think the point somebody else had, had asked this question in the chat about, is it exactly the point you raised, Neil? Is this about where the, the, the center, academic, big academic centers ha are? Um, and you know, I think it's it's an interesting and important question for the for EVIC trialists and for ethicists and all of us to think about this question of burdens and benefits. And, and do we need to, you know, be more selective in 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 which sites you know if we've been doing everything in west philadelphia for the last you know for for a, a you know long time do we need to really maybe spend the extra money and do the trial in in you know a, a place with a different sort of demographic makeup so i, I think it's um like you know th this seems like a, a, a sort of unanswered empirical question in a way but but one that that probably needs more more attention because it's it's a, a challenging one exactly as you said neil that it's sort of both ways, you, you you it's 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 good to be doing research on diseases uh, that you know where trauma, for example, that that it, you know great that we were getting testing therapies and um, so it's it's certainly challenging. Um, well, we're just up against the hour, and I, you know I just want to thank um, Neil and Carrie for a really wonderful discussion. I learned a ton, um, and from all the great questions, there are probably. A dozen more that we just couldn't get to because of time. I tried to prioritize, um, you know, ones that were clustered together. But thank you, Paul and um, Leah. I'll, I'll hand it back to you for any any last thoughts. I just want to echo your thanks and um, thank you, Dr. Sims, Dr. Dickert, 
Dr. Feldman for this really wonderful discussion today and to remind everyone that we will be back in December uh, with our next event and we look forward to continuing the conversation then. Thank you. Thank you Thanks all. So Thank you.